All right, good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started a few minutes early if everyone's ready. Um, so this next presentation will be Imagining a Better Future for Public Health Law. Our presenters are Dr. Evan Anderson and Professor Scott Burris. Dr. Anderson teaches classes on public health law, health policy, and social epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania, where he is an advanced senior lecturer at the School of Nursing and core faculty in the Master of Public Health program. He was formerly the senior legal fellow at the National Program Office for Public Health Law Research. Excuse me. <laughs> um, and a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded academic center based at Temple University Beasley School of Law. Prior to that, Dr. Anderson was a faculty member at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and senior fellow at the Centers for Law and the Public's Health, a collaborative at Johns Hopkins and Georgetown Universities. Dr. Anderson is a public health law researcher. He conducts and writes about research that explores the relationship between laws and population health. Dr. Anderson earned his PhD from Temple University, his law degree from Temple University, and his BA from the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Burris is a professor of law at Temple Law School, where he directs the Center for Public Health Law Research. He is also a professor in Temple School of Public Health. Professor Burris began his career in public health law during the early days of the HIV AIDS epidemic. He was the editor of the first systematic legal analysis of HIV in the United States, AIDS and the Law, a guide for the public, Yale University Press. And he spent several years lobbying and litigating on behalf of people with HIV as an attorney at the American Civil Liberties Union. Since joining the Temple faculty in 1991, his research has focused on how law influences public health and health behavior. In 2009, he founded the Public Health Law Research Program for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which has supported over 80 empirical studies of the impact of law on health, as well as Law Atlas, an innovative policy surveillance portal and a comprehensive resource on scientific health law research methods. In 2014, Professor Burris was the recipient of the American Public Health Association Law Section Lifetime Achievement Award, and in 2018, he was the recipient of the J. Healy Health Law Professors Award. Professor Burris earned his law degree from Yale Law School and his AB from Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Anderson and uh, Professor Burris, thank you so much for being here today. You all can go ahead and take it away. Thanks very much. So I think we'll be taking on some of the questions that have come up throughout the day on, on sort of how to think about what went wrong with COVID. Um, we start our story in 2019 when a group of international experts declared the United States the most prepared country in the world for a pandemic. And had they been right, I think the response to COVID would have looked something like this. The federal government would have moved quickly to, to assess the threat and define a response. It would have provided the expertise and resources the country needed to minimize the harm. Its guidance would have been built on its unparalleled range and depth of relevant expertise. And it would have been framed as a long-term strategic plan that would have evolved transparently and credibly as events, as events unfolded in what was clearly going to be a long-term uh, problem. States and local governments would have evolved transparently and credibly themselves as they added their specialized knowledge and awareness of local conditions so that our federal system would work coherently to take good guidance and apply it effectively. Uncertainty about the, the response and the pathogen would have been placed in the foreground and everyone within and outside the government would have learned and adapted together in a cooperative way as more information came in and better understanding grew. Clearly, we could expect that public faith in the response and cooperation from the public would sometimes falter. We would expect fringe groups to act out. But over time, well-designed measures supported by committed leaders would have vindicated the experts' confidence in, in, uh, in the great capacities of this nation. Unfortunately, those experts who rated us number one were wrong. The United States didn't respond effectively to the COVID-19 pandemic. We weren't even close to the league leaders. The nation has higher rates of infection and infection-related death than almost any peer industrialized country. In the first year of the pandemic, we just had disaster with the United States accounting for 19% of global morbidity and or mortality with just 4% of the global population. And the second year was not much better. Despite 
the rapid development of great vaccines, there were more infection related deaths in 2021 than in 2020. Uh, due to foreseeable vaccine resistance at home and development of variants in the unvaccinated mass of the global population. So several narrative, narratives are getting traction in explaining how our public health system lost its way during COVID-19. The bad leaders narrative focuses on the incredible failings of, if not outright sabotage by the Trump administration and its political allies. The bad budgets narrative attributes the problems in our current public health practice to decades of underinvestment. And a sort of related narrative would be the bad institutions narrative, um, which takes plenty of force and evidence from the continuing missteps by the CDC, by the FDA, and by other key public health entities. There is also, of course, the bad Americans narrative, which locates the root of our poor pandemic response in the characteristics of our populace, which some might characterize as ignorant or selfish or tribal, um, prone to conspiracy theories and vaccine denialism. And of course, we, we recognize that each of these narratives has, has truth in it. And we also recognize that, that law is implicated. Although, um, or, or I should say, you know, consistent with um, some of the other talks earlier today, um, uh, I think in, in particular Yale Cannon's um, um, discussion of the role of law as an um, important social determinant of health, you know, we went into the pandemic as the number one jailer in the, on the planet with over 2 million people incarcerated, um, which is, you know, a high risk setting. Um, there are another 2 million people living in congregate, congregate long-term care facilities, um, which were poorly regulated and which were primarily staffed by um, low-wage employees working at multiple facilities with few um, employment protections like paid leave. Um, Notwithstanding some of those problems, the law did seem to operate, you know, pretty well for the first segment of the pandemic in the sense that um, there was authority for leaders at the federal, state, and local level to pass emergency um, provisions. And uh, there was um, federal authority for large um, spending plans that kept our economy from uh, teetering um, horribly. Um, you know, those sort of early, generally positive performance of the law, um, and, and I should say as well, the courts were open to hear claims. Um, you know, as we moved a little bit deeper into the pandemic, we encountered more difficulty as um, courts started to take um, seriously, um, you know, hysterical exaggeration of some of the liberty interests um, in things like mask wearing, and as they started to use the pandemic to advance um, pre-existing legal agendas of non-delegation and expansion of the free exercise clause. And of course, you know, as we went along, legislation got more difficult. Um, we didn't see congressional action on things like the child tax credit that we otherwise would have hoped for. So, you know, all these explanations have some validity to them, but they're not the most useful ones. And in some ways they take us down the wrong direction when we think about what happens next bad leadership, um, bad infrastructure, uh, uh, irrational citizens. Um, uh, these are all things that are not barriers to public health activity. They're the conditions we're supposed to be able to work with. They're the conditions of our work. They're the problems we're supposed to solve. So what really matters is not to is not whether we saw the same kinds of problems that pop up every time we have a big epidemic like this, as I'm sure um, um, Polly's book is going to show. Um, but what did we do wrong? And what could we do better as people who work in public health, who care about public health, who make public health decisions? And so the failure that we're going to talk about in this paper and, and, and go into some detail on to illustrate and discuss is a failure of judgment under conditions of uncertainty. And therefore, our argument is that probably the most important thing public health can do in the future is make better judgments. Um, and we're going to talk about why public health didn't make good judgments, the kind of judgments they, they made that were bad, um, and um, how this should change in the future. Now, 
in saying this, I mean, we we are not saying that. I mean, in fact, we are we we as member as people who work in public health, we honor public health officials. We appreciate the difficulties that they worked in. You know, we've been part of and and loved the field for you know uh, in, for our entire careers. Um, and in some way, the story we're going to tell focuses on the leadership at the federal level. Um, but I think this the kind of problems that we document in the leadership at the federal level relate to the way the field works, the way people are trained, the prevailing culture of public health, as we'll discuss. And therefore, um, it's not just an indictment of a few top brass people. It's it's a, it's a, it's actually we hope a, a constructive um, uh, push for a different way of thinking about who makes public health decisions and how those decisions get made. So, um, who we we think of ourselves as part of what we call the transdisciplinary model of public health, um, which comes out of the fact that we were lawyers working within public health, right? In this model, what we do in law is not simply something that lawyers do and sort of do in front of or in the presence of um, people who are health trained or work, have public health training, we actually think that lots of the legal work in public health actually gets done by public health officials who aren't lawyers. They design the policies, they typically um, help write the policies, and they certainly provide the evidence to support various formulations of policy. They often do the advocacy or support the advocacy, they do the enforcement and they do the evaluation. So all those key activities of law in public health are not the work of lawyers or primarily the work of lawyers. But really this idea of transdisciplinarity goes beyond law because um, you know, we, one of the things we've always admired most about public health was the sense that this was a field in which psychologists and economists work with epidemiologists, that there were engineers and doctors um, and not just uh, you know, a sort of narrow monoculture of, of science. We thought that when we talked about the science of public health, we were talking about actually a diversity of skills, methods, viewpoints, and theoretical frameworks, all of which were necessary to get good judgments in the face of very complex systemic problems and challenges like, um, like COVID-19. We had seen this, we thought we had seen, we'd been part of this kind of broad public health in dealing with things like um, HIV AIDS, in dealing with things like road deaths and, and eradicating smallpox. And we had faith that, that this same kind of teamwork across disciplines and a sort of rich vision of the tools, the intellectual scientific tools of public health would get us through the COVID-19 um, epidemic. And, and frankly, we were disappointed. Um, we don't think that's what happened. Um, and so as a way of talking about what we think did happen, uh, we're going to start with some fantasy, um, talking about what the response to COVID might have been like if it had sort of conformed to our initial expectations of, of, of what a good public health response should be. So go with us now in your imagination to Washington, D.C. and the office of Alex Azar, um, who right away, um, at the, as, as we're just starting to hear about um, COVID, is we hope ready to lead us in an effective response. I mean, after all, they should be ready, or should have been ready, because they had just wargamed pr pretty much this exact COVID scenario in a tabletop exercise called Crimson Contagion. And Crimson Contagion had predicted that we would lose, um, that we'd have 110 million infections, seven, almost 8 million hospitalizations, and over 500,000 deaths before we got it under control, and that this would happen because um, the tabletop predicted, there would be some real serious breakdowns in the public health response to that kind of pandemic. So what we would imagine as the first step in responding to a, a massive, um, potentially massive thing like COVID would have been a very serious sort of SWOT analysis of how we stood in public health. And we certainly have some strengths. CDC had huge credibility. Um, and, and huge variety, you know, the, the, at the, beneath Alex Azar is the NIH and all its research capacity and Fauci capacity and vaccine development capacity. The FDA has enormous capacity for moving and testing drugs through the system. 
We have NIOSH, which could bring relevant expertise in engineering, particularly the physics of airborne transmission. Um, and we had a strategic national stockpile of pandemic response equipment. In, in terms of law, Azar could invoke the Defense Production Act to, to stimulate the production, purchasing, and allegation of, allocation of all the essential resources we need. Um, he also oversaw CMS which had a lot of levers for coordinating healthcare delivery. I know we have a dis, you know, broken system, it's, it's very detached and all those sort of things, but still, um, uh, most public and private hospitals rely heavily on CMS, uh, on the reimbursement it provides, and it can require them to change practices and share new um, information and also for outpatient services, which potentially leads to all sorts of flexibilities and capacities for dealing with outpatient care. Um, we had an assistant secretary for preparedness and response whose whole mission was to be ready for something like this and who had the capacity to require all government agencies to formulate plans and be ready um, for something like this and including also a yearly review of the of the strategic national stockpile um, from the lawyer's perspective this kind of mission and and authority for hhs was also really a potentially big advantage because at least at the beginning public health leaders and the public, or political leaders and the public would look at CDC and at HHS for guidance. It had the impetus to act. The secretary was empowered to declare a health emergency. Taking advantage of that kind of authority, he could draw on not just his big government network, um, but also partner agencies outside the health system, outside HHS. And of course, really upon the lifelong scientific and professional networks that HHS staff would have with experts in other agencies um, and academia. Now, of course, we also would hope, and this is a crucial part of, of good, uh, good judgment for CDC, that there would be an understanding of some of the limitations, um, some of the weaknesses that our system has. I mean, after the Crimson Contagion, we should have been aware that you know, we would have problems with agencies actually doing the jobs they were assigned to do. Um, we had a CDC that had struggled with basic public health operations in recent years. Um, it had botched uh, possible cases of drug-resistant tuberculosis. Um, it had laboratories that had failed basic tests of competency in managing biohazardous material. Um, there was longstanding concern that maybe the, the, the greatest brains in CDC had already perhaps been drained out. A particular importance, we should have been aware, as Azar would have been aware, that the, the CDC produced a monumentally faulty test uh, during the Zika outbreak by trying to add way too many bells and whistles to it. And even more concerning, at the time, the agency refused to disclose the test's fault or, or the availability of a better test. And they even punished CDC whistleblowers who brought that to light. This poor record should have been top of mind. Um, on official uh, in, in official minds, because we, one of the things we we're going to clearly need for for this outbreak were cheap, effective, mass-produced tests. Uh, beyond the problem of testing, um, there was the problem of of on-the-ground logistics, um, gathering information from dozens or hundreds of health departments, passing information back, managing the border with actual personnel who could identify people coming in from China or from wherever else we started to say the threat was coming and to manage the process of tracing them and tracking them and maintaining control via the state and local health departments. Um, CDC has really not been doing this much and not been doing it well. Um, it's been a long time since it was a groundwork agency um, and Really, it's not all that well designed to convene and lead other agencies. Its current director at the director at the time was a virologist and lab researcher who'd never run a public health agency. Bureaucracy was a weakness. FDA, although it had powers to cut cut red tape and move things quickly, was a very ponderous agency that had never used um, its expediting authority under such high stakes or under such high scrutiny. And in fact, there was also some bureaucratic infighting between um, people in the administration, who, so that we had to sort of consider that some of the cooperation might not be forthcoming. We knew that there would be um, a shortage of materials. The strategic national stockpile had been depleted in, 19, in 2009 during an influenza epidemic. It had only 12 million N95 uh, mass in stock. It had a lot of stuff that was designed in anticipation of an anthrax attack or an influenza pandemic and was not quite prepared for a, the contingency of a coronavirus. 
Um, we also could tell or should have known right off the bat that we would be running into supply chain disruptions in a world of just-in-time inventory. And of course, if, if Azar stepped back from HHS, they would know that the public system, health system um, isn't a health system, isn't a public health system, but thousands of state and local health officers who report to hundreds of elected officials and whose powers are conditioned by state and local um, politics. Healthcare is completely cut off from CDC operations by the org chart of HHS and by a century of, of practical separation between public health and health care. Any effort to mobilize this system, quote unquote, would have faced massive, massively decayed infrastructure in at least two, two dimensions. One was the problem of transmitting health information, which in our system had, has gotten closer to the Pony Express than the World Wide Web. Uh, this was going to hamper tracking people and keeping in basic situation awareness, early efforts to control um, or prevent uh, community transmission. But more importantly, these this, this problem of, of, of poor data links really was reflected the, the larger problem of continuous cutting of health agency resources. There's just too many people with too few, with, with old and, and, and not sufficient equipment. Um, it, a few Ebola cases had strained us. Millions of cases that we're potentially looking at for COVID would, would have been even worse. Um, and of course, the society um, was you know, definitely going to present um, a problem. Um, we have a lot of economic inequality, which means a lot of people working um, long hours um, in crowded conditions um, with few workplace protections, living in crowded settings, particularly low wage workers who could not afford to miss a paycheck and didn't have paid leave um, would be working regardless of how they felt. Um, basic services like healthcare and food distribution would, would depend upon low wage essential workers to keep them going and yet they weren't well protected um, although the affordable care act had reduced the uninsured there were still you know at least 30 million people who, who had limited access to doctors and then of course there was national leadership i don't think we need to say more about that but clearly donald trump um, as president was not somebody um, who you could necessarily count on to take the the uh, rational uh, restrained public health leadership approach um, that, that would support, um, ideally, the work of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the problem. So that was sort of the, a bunch of internal weaknesses and opportunities, but there were also some uh, external threats. And I'll turn it over to, to, to Evan to say more about that. Sure. So our external threats, um, like our weaknesses, were formidable. The biggest was the subject itself. The new virus could really be that big one that could spread all over the world in successive waves, mutating as it spread. Almost as bad could be the global response, the dismal state of our global health system and American global leadership were big potential problems. WHO, for better or worse, serves the nations of the world, and particularly, though, it serves those who pon pony up money. Um, like CDC, it had developed a reputation for bureaucratic caution, and its legal authority was set out in the uh, international health regulations with significant limitations and known flaws. In theory, those regulations were meant to undergird cooperation among nations coordinated by WHO, but there was nothing in them to stop the panicked, uh, panicked global leaders from letting loose a cascade of individual travel restrictions, which could quickly disrupt supply chains, as we saw. Um, supply chains we depend on for basic products not made in the United States, like masks. These could trigger economic and social effects of the sort that SARS and Ebola had hinted at in recent decades, but not at a scale seen in modern times. So, um, you know, at this point, we, we sort of shift a little bit, right? Given the SWOT analysis early in the month of January, we can imagine the leadership team would have turned next to drawing in ex, uh, expertise and farming out key questions and issues for rapid assessment before the press and the public inevitably grasped the severity of the problem. Rather than a, two, a few top people, trying to plan based on whatever ideas happen to filter up, there would be working groups the way we are reimagining this, systematically trying to get a handle on a wide but finite set of key issues. The composition and methods of the groups would be aimed at explicitly at harvesting the benefits of transdisciplinarity and reducing the effects of well-recognized professional and cognitive biases. Secretary Azar and his leadership team would have had to consider how best to support and benefit from international cooperate, cooperation. 
Taking advantage of the opportunity for significant, significant international cooperation could inform membership on the working groups. But it went beyond working with WHO and other nodes on the global health network. It suggested a need to enlist entities like the Department of State and Defense, the United States Trade Representative and United States Agency for International Development to mobilize the diplomatic and financial resources to find common ground and forestall competition on travel restrictions, supply chains, vaccines, and medicine development. We envision an epidemiology group in our task force structure, which would explore the characteristics of disease transmission and progression. It was obvious at this point that we were dealing with airborne transmission, but was it really through droplets um, or by aerosols or by bolt? Spread by droplets, characteristic of influenza happens in close quarters when infected people cough or sneeze. If the root of transmission was just droplets, then keeping physical distance, implementing physical barriers, and sanitizing hands and surfaces would all have been necessary and useful measures to reduce spread. Outdoor risks would not be that different than indoor. Um, if COVID-19 aerosols could accumulate in the air and hang there for extended periods of time, as with TB, however, then ventil ventilation systems would be important risk and preventative factors. And masks would be an even higher priority. It was similarly essential to confirm in line with Dr. Fauci's strong expectation that people could not produce enough viral material to transmit the virus if they were not displaying symptoms. Understanding the health effects of the virus was necessary to gauge not just direct morbidity and mortality, but also the indirect knock-on harms if a wave of hospitalizations overwhelmed hospitals. A public health countermeasures group would be assigned with the task of working out realistic response options given prevailing conditions. This would require starting with the SWAT findings in considering whether and how to hold a line, for example, tight border controls uh, and tracking of people entering the United States and what lines might have to be abandoned in an order, orderly retreat, like if those border measures were uh, infeasible. Public health orthodoxy and international law took a dim view on border controls, both for their perceived ineffectiveness and for their certain social and economic costs. But the underlying evidence base one way or the other, one way or the other was weak. And there might be value in slowing penetration to prepare a response even for a matter of a week or two. Uh, Wuhan was showing that rapid community transmission was a possibility, which meant thinking about changes in daily life that were unprecedented in modern times. Crimson Contagion pointed to a problem of surging demand for basic medical supplies. Likewise, testing was a highly likely need and vaccine would be indispensable if the disease broke through. A medical countermeasures group, therefore, would start identifying and preparing for contingencies, including the development of tests, vaccines, and treatments. We would also have to find ways to prevent or alleviate equipment shortages, including using the emergency market powers provided in the Defense Production Act. In addition to, the, to their specific charges, all three of these groups would be asked to use de-biasing tools like Haddon matrices and causal modeling. These would help them identify links or mediators uh, of the causal chains that they were otherwise implicitly constructing and to avoid settling too soon on an inferior option. The groups would be encouraged to complete weekly pre-mortems. This is a, a sort of a a term and a, and a methodology popularized by um, Dan Kahneman, which is trying to imagine everything that could go wrong based on their SWOT. So thinking about, you know, imagining a future of failure and then thinking about what, what could be the potential causes of those failures. Um, they'd have to do this every week. Each of these groups would have a membership of some reasonable number, um, but each member would be linked to a larger professional network. Um, all of the working groups identified would be deliberately staffed to be transdisciplinary, but their missions and orientation would still be likely to bias them towards familiar public health thinking. For that reason, it would be important to actively foster diverse, critical, even contrarian thinking. Our version of Secretary Azar would accomplish this by creating what in the past uh, CDC had sometimes called Team B. This rethinking and brainstorming group would include scientists, academics, public health and legal practitioners, able to spot potential errors and hidden pitfalls in the work of the other teams. It would also include ethicists, social justice advocates, retired politicians, community and business leaders, or decent proxies for all these people. And, and the role of this group would be to consider equity, trade-offs of all kinds, and perhaps most importantly, 
um, whether and to what extent values other than minimizing COVID morbidity and mortality needed to be taken into account. Um, finally, it was reasonably clear that a primary challenge would be trying to understand the key dimensions of the crisis while having to respond to it um, and to respond to a deluge of demands for daily action information. So the working group had to have the best and the most experienced people, and they couldn't be the people leading the initial operations, like dealing with the cruise ship outbreaks that would soon pop up. Um, this required at least three things. First, segregating operations and planning responsibilities, establishing a press secretariat team that would deal with media, coordinate the White House communications team, um, and keeping the message honest, sharing what facts were known, but making it clear that for the moment, the health team was going to focus on analyzing and planning. For now, public attention was still elsewhere, and the best message was the truth. We're working 24-7 to understand the threat and what to do about it. All right, so now it may seem like we just have a brief for committees. And, you know, the problem is there weren't enough of them, not enough bureaucracy. But that's that's not the point, right? What we're really trying to get across here with this illustration is that a, a, a managing a new epidemic like this or a new pandemic is a problem of, of judgment under uncertainty. And that means it's a problem of information plus the lack of information. We document in our paper, and you can see other people have done the same, like Zanet Tufeki and many of the books that we cite, um, that the key signals um, that would have driven better judgments about COVID were, were available very early, very early. Um, it would have been reasonable to believe, and certainly no later than mid-January when the Diamond Princess pro uh, case emerged in, in, in Japan, that this was a disease that could well be spread by um, aerosols and asymptomatic people. Um, we would have been aware much earlier than, than WHO admitted it and CDC said it, that there was a very good chance that um, this was being spread person to person. Um, and in fact, that it had been around for a bit longer than China was already, you know, in, in its grudging admissions admitting. These were not things that we're seeing in retrospect. In our paper, we go through and document the people who were saying these things at the time. And so, you know, the problem that the reason we end up talking about committees and groups and, 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 and diversified planning is there was just too much, too many questions for people to investigate, to have it be a totally centralized response. And there was too much risk that the pressure of time, the pressure of of, 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 of professional bias or other factors would lead people to make mistakes. Um, that we would be essentially so caught up with responding to what happened that day and so short of staff thinking strategically behind that front line that the um, response at the public health level would devolve into a series of reactions. Um, and essentially the time between about December, January 1 and uh, February 15th, you know, was the key time before the ball was really rolling down the hill too fast when CDC and Azar and the whole team and the federal agencies and the state and their state agency partners could have gotten ahead of the game, um, could have realized, for example, that there was likely to be a real problem with um, contact tracing and isolation that there was likely to be closure of schools and that was going to be a problem, that they would have to think about how they prepare for six months from now so that schools can open. And they, all that kind of thinking comes not from a few people um, looking at the newspapers and talking about how to war game the next press statement, but from actually using the incredible infrastructure of people and diverse knowledge that was at the disposal of the system to figure out um, to, to follow out the feedback loops and, and system changes that were gonna play out over the next few months. So we think, you know, early at this stage, um, the, the public health countermeasure group would, would have very quickly, much more quickly than they did, identified um, some targets for action that really, you know, we only got underway acting on much, much later in the pandemic. This would have included engineering interventions to make um, indoor spaces safer. That would include schools and hospitals and other places. 21st century case finding that could have meant apps. Uh, genomic and genetic surveillance were um, dramatically underutilized, even though they were available. Um, 
Certainly thinking through measures to reduce close physical interaction. Um, emergency measures for congregate settings would have been top of mind very, very early in the, um, in the spring. Um, of course, thinking through schools and masks and protections for workers, and then titrating all these, you know, creating a coherent um, system based on local case rates um, so that you could conserve some of these measures and not deploy them um, in instances that were, that were unnecessary. Um, we think the medical and pharmaceutical working group would have been um, you know, drawn much earlier to um, some of the problems that, that only came out later, which, which was fundamentally a lack of visibility into um, where actual supplies were <laughs> in our country. Um, they would have recognized that most of the production was overseas, that most of healthcare entities in our country rely on just-in-time um, restocking, which means that hospitals have very few reserves. Um, they would have appreciated that you know, borders were going to close and uh, outbreaks would hit other countries and that the supply chains were incredibly fragile. Um, hoarding would be an issue, uh, not just by citizens and with masks, but also health. Uh, healthcare systems, um, it was going to take time and it was going to take money and guarantees to, um, to stimulate um, domestic companies to jump into production because even just in the recent past, companies had created new production lines uh, only to see demand shrink when um, epidemics didn't, you know, uh, expected epidemics didn't materialize. And of course, there was going to be a whole glut of new product, product uh, producers and manufacturers. There was a real need at FDA to be prepared to vet um, new products quickly and to address potential counterfeiting. Um, all right, um, you know, early, much earlier on, we think it should have been especially clear um, that congregate settings were. Um, you know, we're, we're a much higher risk setting. Um, and, and this, again, was sadly validated. Um, it's really sort of inexcusable that there were no mask requirements for staff or residents, um, that there weren't any real testing requirements for staff and residents in carceral settings and in uh, congregate long-term care facilities. So we think those, you know, were, were screamingly obvious um, in, in March. Um, as well, you know, it was pretty clear that there, that there were employees going from um, one long-term care facility to another, carrying the virus with them. That's something that CDC observed uh, in that early study of the Seattle SNF uh, skilled nursing facility. Um, you know, there should have been guidance on, vi on visiting, and that guidance should have taken into consideration not just the risk of infection, but also the very real and serious um, you know, potential harms of, of family members uh, being disconnected from each other. Um, finally, we should have gotten much, you know, more aggressive with rapid decarceration of non-dangerous, non-convicted prisoners much earlier in the pandemic, which would have prevented those carceral settings from being engines of uh, transmission. So we think about March, we can think about uh, uh, the beginning of um, some short, so we, you know, we sort of, as we get later into March, we think our groups should have um, convened on a set of short, medium, and long-term um, goals. Um, the short-term goals um, would have focused on you know, manufacture and distribution of rapid testing. Right? It was very clear that we would need lots of tests and we would need them to be available on a very low threshold basis. Um, it was equally clear that we needed to have targeted um, um, density restrictions that would be tied to local spread. Local spread. Um, masking indoors was, you know, a, should have been a, a sort of a key part of the immediate effort starting in March. Um, better attention to production um, and a long-term strategy for collaborative management of, of scarce resources like masks and ventilators was an immediate need early in the spring. And then, of course, by this point, there should have been more attention to uh, a more systematic um, way of communicating um, to to the to the U.S. populace that would that would be durable 
um, and that would um, reflect um, changes in uncertainty in the underlying evidence. Um, our medium term goals would have um, focused on schools. So they would have, you know, much of this action would have taken place in the summer, but it would have been looking forward to the fall. So, you know, the summer should have provided plenty of time to get ahead um, in terms of thinking about outdoor, outdoor school, um, enhanced engineering. Um, we would have thought much more carefully about social and economic pressures um, so that the various stakeholders or other sorts of interventions wouldn't have harmful effects on, on lower wage workers. Um, and this would be important to prevent that harm, but also to, to promote compliance. Um, surely, surely we could have we, we could have and should have explored a emergency temporary standard for enhanced worker protection much earlier. Um, we would have wanted NIH and NSF to take on more of a leadership role in um, coordinating research so that we didn't have a lot of small, inadequately powered studies creating findings um, that, that were um, impossible to, to actually you know, provide findings of any, of any significance. You know, NIH and NSF would have worked together to identify the most important questions and to provide the resources so that they would be answered in a way that was um, valuable and, and policy relevant. Um, we would have been working to provide and to make sure that there was um, an adequate system for assuring the production of um, the most key resources and that it was global. Um, so that would be masks and supplies and starting to think about also the components of vaccine and, and tests. Um, Scott, do you want to pick up the long range items? I think we've well, I think what I want to get to here is just I think we've made the point and we make the point in the paper that when you look back upon what happened, you see all these things that should have happened sooner and more effectively. And our point and what we try and document is this is not hindsight, that at the time, the kinds of decisions we're talking about could have been made and the kind of responses we're talking about should have been implemented. And there were lots of people telling CDC and uh, federal health leadership this. Um, so the question is why? Why did it you know, take so long? Why did, for example, we not realize that um, the greatest moment for influencing you know, Pfizer and, 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 and other drug companies about ensuring global access to vaccines would be at the beginning when the money and negotiations were on the table, uh, not once they had, had, had got the money and made the vaccines? You know, why weren't we thinking long term? Um, why weren't we thinking of stages? Why weren't we recognizing that once we had a vaccine, we would have a huge problem with vaccine resistance because we always have problems with vaccine resistance? Um, why did we not prepare and think longer about how you build support and maintain support for, C for, for public health recommendations? Why did we not take that kind of stuff more seriously? Well, you know, we described this, we use this imaginary process and thinking about how people make good judgments generally um, as a kind of heuristic to make clear that um, good judgment is possible and talk about what makes judgment good. First of all, diversity of, 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 of input, diversity of decision makers, diversity of expertise are really crucial. Um, processes that, that, that address and cut down on bias rather than those that sort of amp up bias the way we tended to see things. Um, a long time frame and the recognition that um, we were we we couldn't think of the next, you know, 760 days of the pandemic as a new pandemic every day. That we had actually to think about where we wanted to be in week 10 and week 20 and week 30 and figure out what had to be done now so that we would be where we wanted to be. I mean, a perfect example of that is the possibility had CDC recognized um, the. Um, the limits, well, had CDC been able to recognize uh, aerosol transmission, um, it would have then naturally have recognized the need for and the value of um, air filtration and uh, air engineering. Um, and it would have drawn right away on the resources of the federal government and academia in that area, which it did not do. Um, and we could have had a plan for well-ventilated schools that would have been ready to launch in September or October of 2020. Um, if CDC had recognized 
what was going on with airborne transmission um, and with asymptomatic transmission, and if it had accepted the just uh, even out of the precautionary principle, um, the possibility that even in January we were having um, sustained community spread in the United States, then it would have recognized that you know border controls were not likely to help us um, and would be too little too late. And then in fact, we already had to shift to a more community oriented control strategy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All these things were possible. So what does this tell us? What does this counterfactual story tell us about these failures of judgment and how to go ahead? And I turn it back to you, Evan. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to, for the purposes of time, until we can get to the discussion, I'm going to, I'm going to um, abbreviate this a little bit, but, um, you know, the, the Trump administration and Secretary Azar did convene um, a task force. Yeah, it was a small task force and it didn't include key players from the FDA and um, from CMS until almost a month into the, uh, into the pandemic. Um, there were plenty of missteps along the way um, that you know in 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 many ways reflect a, a sort of a sort of insular group of thinkers some of them with lots of experience but who were you know perhaps led astray by some of the assumptions that they made and you know I, I would you know I'm a big fan of of you know Anthony Fauci um, but you know multiple times like many other people throughout the the pandemic, um, you know, his his statements reflected views that were, um, you know, often reasonable, consistent with history, consistent with expertise, but which turned out to be entirely wrong. Um, and and you know, I think as a field, we sometimes were very immodest in in the way that we held those out. You know, the key ones we kind of alluded to earlier were definitely the failure to recognize that. Um, there could be a lot of asymptomatic spread, and and that was you know particularly harmful because it it sort of bled into the epistemology um, of some other features of our thinking and our understanding of the virus. We were so focused on fomites and the idea that you know the the virus was landing on surfaces and that we needed to clean our fruit, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in part because the um, the scientists and, and the leaders like Anthony Fauci had a had a model in their mind of COVID that was that was more like influenza, um, where um, spread is usually is usually symptomatic. So as they saw these chains of transmission that they couldn't explain for lack of um, symptomatic individuals, uh, they attributed it to fomites. Um, our government also fell into this pattern of kind of mistaking, you know, the you know, conflating the absence of evidence with evidence of absence, right? Where, you know, we, we it was really uh, um, it was really unfortunate that we didn't have tests, and that fed into this really mistaken confidence that the virus wasn't spreading and spreading exponentially early in the fall, early in the spring, which it was. You know, when uh, Anthony Fauci made that statement on February twenty first, CDC had found something like seventy five cases around there or maybe maybe less you know modeling suggests it was something more like twenty five thousand cases at that point and we and, and and that was you know that was sort of intuitive um we um you know i think for the purposes of time we could we could maybe just sort of push on um in terms of of um you know our 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 test that the cdc put out was you know we relived our zika test debacle, um, except in the much higher stakes of, of COVID where the CDC rolled out a flawed test, um, was too slow to correct it, and um, didn't allow other labs to uh, deploy their own tests. Um, and we just didn't show the sense of urgency to get testing right early um, and to address that as perhaps the most important rate limiting factor of our other uh, response options. Because we didn't have the tests, we ended up, you know, deploying this massive shutdown in the spring of 2020 um, in many parts across the country where COVID was not prevalent yet. 
So, you know, we, there were shutdowns in Florida and Texas, notwithstanding the fact that the virus wasn't really there and circulating. Um, and that just made it very difficult to sustain the credibility behind, um, the, behind the science and behind the control measures that would be needed when those places did you know, encounter their viral wave um, later in the summer and, and in the early fall. So we're, we're sort of coming up on our, on our time here, Scott. Do you want to say a couple of words in conclusion or? Sure, well, I think- How do you want to use our- I think our, our, our ultimate point is that a bunch of decisions were made that should have been made better. And they were made um, not because people are stupid and bad and we want to try to throw the blame at a small number of people, but I think because really we think of the culture of how modern federal at least, but I think generally public health is working. Um, Good judgment comes from a diversity of inputs and it comes from processes that reduce bias and, and require people to, to sort of think about systems, systems effect and time. Um, our public health system is run by people who don't have training in that. Um, we heard constantly about following the science and it became pretty clear that the science people were talking about was epidemiology and that following the science meant deducing from some pattern of disease and some mechanisms of disease, what might be the platonic response um, for uh, reducing, for breaking those processes. There was very little input and apparently very little awareness of everything from the social psychology of you know, response to rules to um, how you actually uh, transform rules into norms or the effect of rules on social norms. We didn't think about um, bringing in uh, uh, sociologists and economic, economists and anthropologists to, to help think about how we, or let alone lawyers and socio-legal scholars, to think about how you might actually create an efficient regulatory scheme that actually motivated um, and, and incentivized people to respond. Instead, we just got these sort of things as we're continuing to get these sort of, here's the newest rule, God knows why, God knows how it's gonna be implemented, there's, you know, there's the authority for it, although that's increasingly being undermined. Um, but, um, you know, not really the, the whole front end of law, the whole part about how you get people to comply um, with rules and you make people support the rules and build legitimacy of, of rule systems. So, you know, we understand, we don't think this is the only one. I mean, I think similar things are happening with the opioid epidemic and other areas where public health uh, is not succeeding the way we would like it to succeed. Um, we have to understand that um, training people in a hierarchical system largely medical system and scientific system um, where top brass gets deferred to and authority flows down and um, there's a very rigorous but extremely narrow science is the right culture for public health. We need a culture for public health that is much more diverse and that means we also need a leadership in public health that's much more diverse. Um, you know, we might talk about transforming schools of public health into multidisciplinary schools of social problem solving. We might actually recognize that, that maybe we need an NIH Institute of the Social Causes of Illness and Misery. We have to talk about these changes because it's the system of how we think about public health and how we train people to work in public health that ultimately creates the people um, and the agencies that are there when the pandemic strikes. And we don't think that's a problem of rewriting the law. We don't think that's a problem of somehow the wrong authority was there. And we don't think it does any good to blame the politicians or the anti-vaxxers um, or any of the other things that get in the way of implementing good public health judgment. Making good judgments and implementing good judgments is the job of public health. And if there's one way you can say that public health broke down in COVID, that cuts across all the other you know, difficulties and challenges is was that good judgments were not made and the judgments that were not made were really poorly implemented. Um, and that's really where you know, the important lessons of COVID lie for us who wanna do public health better in the future. Great, thank you both so much um, for your presentation. We will now get into the Q&A portion um, for just a few, for the remainder of the time. Um, 
first question, a previous speaker argued for local and state governments, not the federal government to lead disease control and prevention efforts. Your presentation seems to lean on the opposite end in favor of federal agencies leading a lot of these efforts. Can those be reconciled and how can local and state governments work with the federal government to control and prevent disease outbreaks? Well, I think the answer here is that we shouldn't overestimate structure. I mean, it is just a 200 year constant in America that we have a federal system and epidemics happen all over the place. And sometimes somebody from the CDC comes in and helps, you know, or the, the Marine Hospital Service comes in and helps San Francisco deal with this plague epidemic. And sometimes, you know, it happens out of a local, you know, the response is locally driven. Um, I think that what, what, we, what we would say is that our system heightens the need for good judgment um, and effective planning because you have a system that needs to be coordinated and aligned. If you have a diverse system of actors operating in the same space at the same time on the same problem, you have to have kind of a clear moon or sun, you know, a star above them. They're all kind of aiming towards. It's kind of providing insight and guidance to where they want to get because they have to be able to coordinate autonomously. You know, it, it's not top down, but it is top illuminated. And that is the role of the federal government. The role of the federal government and the capacity of the federal government is to set a sort of good plan in place and then support um, and help age, uh, the, the many state and local agencies that are trying to carry out that plan. And I would just add to that, I mean, we it's really important to have states and localities have the authority to, to experiment and make policy because we can learn from that. Um, but we also saw as a case study the, the failures of federalism with respect to scarce medical supplies. I mean, that's one instance where we, where we, needed, we needed the federal government to step in. It was incredibly harmful to have states you know, fighting for a scarce limit, you know, scarce supply of resources. Uh, coordinating research you know, has to play a role. I think his video is frozen. Uh, we'll just try to wait, see if he comes back. Well, why don't we go on with some other questions? And... That sounds like a good plan. Great, that sounds good to me. Um, so another question in the Q&A um, says, I don't mean to minimize the importance of good judgment and I don't disagree with your analysis of what should have happened, but it seems like you are discounting the bad faith in which the Trump administration was operating at every step of the way. How do you know that public health folks within the administration weren't pushing for the initiatives you advocate and weren't being stimmied by their politically motivated employers? Well, that's a great question, and I want to emphasize that we are utterly sympathetic to the criticism of the Trump administration. It was a disaster. Um, I think we, we make two points in the paper. One is that bad leaders are always there. This is just nothing unusual in the history of pandemics. Like, it's the conditions we work in. You've got an idiot in charge. Not always, and sometimes you have good people, but you very frequently have idiots, and you can't just say, oh, well, I tried, but I've got an idiot in charge. we got to do better than that. And the second reason that we say that it didn't happen is that we've looked at the accounts, the contemporaneous accounts of what happened um, and we and, and describe in the paper what happened. Um, so, no, it, 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 we didn't um, we don't have a situation where the CDC had a great plan and it was stymied by the uh, by the Trump administration. We have a situation in which the CDC had pretty bad plans and the Trump administration just made it worse. Next question is, from a public health law standpoint, what more could have been done? Well, we wrote two editions. I mean, and a bunch of, some of the people on, on, on you know, today's presentation were part of it. We wrote two reports in the first year of COVID, um, pandemic legal assessments um, that are still available and they go through you know, one thing after another um, that, that could have been done across the board. And that is, of course, the problem with a social, socially you know, profuse pandemic, right? Just there's so many things that need to be done from telehealth, 
and changing the rules for getting into your, you know, getting your methadone to, um, you know, paid sick leave and occupational safety and health protection and, you know, actually, you know, trying to increase access to the internet. Um, you know, there's just so many things that the law can do. And that's why diversity matters. We just don't live in a world anymore where one, you know, profession or one viewpoint is sufficient to manage large social problems. Um, and so, you know, even as it seems like authority is getting more and more centralized because of the day-to-day -day demands of the media and sort of the 24-hour news cycle and everything is observed so closely and people are sort of trying to pull authority and decision-making into a tight circle, you know, the world is actually demanding a much more diffuse um, and more deliberative form of decision-making. Um, but it takes courage. It takes, and it, I think in this case, it would have, this is an example of where the Trump administration and I think some gubernatorial administrations did better, you know, where they actually recognized that they had time to think through a response that they could support for the next month, two, three, four. And they were also ready to think of plan B and ready to think of the exit strategy from the plans they were implementing. We did see that. Um, in COVID, many, you know, we had several governors who at various times seemed like heroes because they were taking a more systematic approach. And, you know, obviously we want to encourage that. Um, the law is neutral to this because the law is just a bunch of authorities and powers. Um, the, 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 the public health law imperative is not, I think, to rewrite the law, although that's happening. The public health law imperative is to increase our ability and our capacity to effectively use the law. And that effective, the ability to do that is much more important than the text of the law, by and large. Great, thank you so much, Professor Burris. Um, I think we are out of time, but thank you and uh, Dr. Anderson so much for being here today. Um, we're now going to take a quick break before our next uh, presentation on reforming age cutoffs for Medicare. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Anderson, yeah, we lost you there at the end, but uh, it's good to see that you're back at least. Um, thank you for everything. That was very frustrating. I'm so sorry. I don't know why that happened. I'm in a conference room in a hotel. I apologize. That might explain it. The hotel internet can sometimes be unpredictable, uh, but thank you so much for your contribution today. Um, Thanks to the staff. I know our piece is quite long and there's a lot of work and you guys did a wonderful job with it. So thanks again. I think you're muted, Scott. I was adding to your thanks and saying, go back and do your vacation now. <laughs> Sorry, I lost you there. But, um, go out and play. All right. All right, sounds good. See ya.